Heave high, heave high, ho, oh, the best man in Ottawa was Maharaj Joe, Maharaj Joe. Big Joe Mafara paddle in the Mattawa all the way from Ottawa in just one day. Hey, hey. Hello, folks. Welcome back to How's It Going, eh? Got a great show for you today. We got uh, John Doerr. I, his name looks like a Jean Doré, but he's from Ottawa, and uh, he does a great show that he do on the TV. Uh, he was on comedy for a long time. Now he's in L.A. still making us laugh. Uh, sort of put Canada on the funnier die map. Uh, and we'll be talking about why Canadians are so funny. You can just tell me just talking now. I'm incredibly funny. I'm not even trying. We'll also talk about the in in innate meanness in Canada. John Cleese said comedy, all comedy is mean-spirited deep down. And I think that's true. Maybe that's why men are funnier than women. We're just crueler. Um, and that is evidenced in John and my favorite movie ever, Windy City Heat. Speaking of movies, remember FUBAR? Well, Terry and the Deaner have another movie out called A Legend of Whitey. I'm talking about Dave Lawrence and Paul Spence. We've got Paul Spence on the show. You'll be shocked to see he doesn't look anything like the Deaner. And he's just an actor who is playing a character. And, of course, we have Janet Bloomfield. Who's that? Just a housewife up in Thunder Bay. Yeah. Housewives determine elections. They got Justin Trudeau elected. Yet we never see them on news shows. As far as I'm concerned... CNN should have, you know, political pundit here, economist, and then Janet, just a woman in an apron. Why? Their voices determine elections. They are a major part of the future of every country, yet we never hear their point of view. So Janet, the regular housewife from Thunder Bay, will be discussing why uh, barking at Beyonce got her kicked off Twitter. Let's roll it. Our next guest uh, is John Doerr. No, not Jean Doré, là. He's English. He's from my hometown of Ottawa, Ottawa Valley. I see him as an Ottawa guy, whether he was born there or not. But um, he uh, had a show on CTV there that uh, it, I was watching it the other night to get ready for this. And I was reminded of something I want to bring up with John when we get him on the show. And John Cleese has, has brought this up, so I'm, I'm stealing it here. But I think comedy is... Inherently mean. Yeah, you heard me. John Cleese said all jokes at, at some point are mean-spirited. He re reiter reiterated it recently in a video where he said uh, that uh, there's some criticism in all humor. But before that, he did another one where he said that it's mean-spirited. And, and I really think that's true. And that might be why men seem to be more into comedy than women, because we're meaner. <laughs> we're bigger jerks. But check out this uh, interview that John did with a feminist. Uh, that not only sums up men and humor, but what makes Canadians unique. Good morning, feminist. My name's Judy. <laughs> My name is John. I was at a bar last night, and it was ladies' night, which meant that ladies got in free and men had to pay. Were you aware that women are getting special treatment? Yeah, I'm aware, but it's not special treatment for women. It's special yeah, it treatment. is. No, it isn't. It's they don't have to pay and men do. Yeah, but why is that? Why do you go to the bar? Pick up chicks, drink exactly. beer. Exactly. Bring the <laughs> home with me. Don't use it. <laughs> home? It's a bad word. Don't use it. At least not while I'm Check out her but tone. I songs all the time. Like, yeah. bring your yeah. and, and your you hear hoes, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So but that's now you hear hoes, too, right? I don't think they mean it like all women are They hoes. do. They do. <clears throat> Sorry, my phone's ringing, honestly. Sorry, guys. Hello? It's just rude. What up? <laughs> yeah, I'll see you later tonight, ho. All right. <clears throat> My mom, she's on vacation. Yeah, right. Anyway. anyway uh, okay, so the reason they let the women in free is so guys like you will find women when you go into the bar. Why do women go to bars? To meet men. Yeah, but not as many single women go to bars as single men. Because a lot of women don't like getting hit on by guys like you. Guys like me? Yeah. I'm a courteous gentleman. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I was making assumptions. Mm -hmm. You're very, uh, very sexy when you, uh, when you're confident like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. If I get a boner, just. <laughs> All right. That's enough of that. Hey, John, are you there? I'm here. I agree. Enough of that. Ah, enough of that. That's ancient that. news. What was that? Three years old? That's at least three years old. That would be, yeah, 2000. And that's 2009. Why can't I see your face? Oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Do you think you're I... more attractive than me? <laughs> Do I think that I'm more attractive than you? Yeah. 
Absolutely not. I think you're a fine looking specimen. Yeah. I, I am. You're, I'm you're like a man. I'm a six point five. You're a seven point four. And you're just <laughs> You know what? You've been living in L.A. so long, you're developing this lying thing they do where they go, you look amazing. <laughs> no, that's not, it's not true. I've always thought it because I've been watching you from afar and you didn't even know it. I've been watching you for a long time. I've seen you train. I've seen you exercise and prepare for a fight. <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Boot. Yes. <clears throat> yes. The Perry fight, but we can talk about that later. We'll get to Maybe that in a second. We'll get Who's to that in a second. The show? Am I hosting it or are you hosting it? Exactly. Shut okay. up. All right. You're right. I am becoming American. Go ahead. Do you agree with me that a big part of humor is kind of being a dick? Um. Well, I think what is the? I'd love to know the exact John Cleese quote, but I will say this. Um, uh, yeah, oftentimes there's a victim in comedy. I don't know if being a dick's the right word. but It's kind I, of I, ethereal, but let me put it this way. Worrying about yeah. someone's feelings and trying to make sure that no one's offended is the death knell. Yes, no, absolutely. I agree there. I, think there sh I don't think there should be rules imposed. Uh, I think it should be kind of a free world. The audience should decide you know, what they laugh at and what they don't. But I think everyone should have an attempt at uh, saying what they think is funny in their own minds. Um, uh, what, one kind of opposing argument is, uh, I would say, Mitch Hedberg, the uh -huh. late great. If you really take a listen to a lot of his jokes, and clearly very thoughtful, funny, philosophical takes on life itself, um, you know, almost victimless jokes. You know, it's yeah. just observations about bananas and escalators breaking. Like, can you really call those things victims? Maybe he's dealing in the inanimate world, so it's less offensive. But almost, if you listen to a lot of his work, almost all of it is victimless, I would say, and completely absent of uh, any mean-spiritedness. Yeah, and what happened to him? <laughs> he's dead. I don't know. I'm pretty sure he's on tour. What? Yeah, he croaked. Oh, so okay. there goes that and now there goes that example. So, um, no, I think that Canadian people always ask us why we're so hilarious, and we are obviously very funny. Even this repertoire back and forth is is gut bustingly hilarious. Um, people are loving it. Look at the comments. <laughs> look at the hearts exploding in the bottom right. Uh, <laughs> but I think hosers, we have this thing, and I bring it back to Scottish culture. Scottish drunk culture is a big part of um, of uh, Canadian culture. And that is sort of like, what are you doing over there? Look at this guy strolling in here, you know, using people's last names. Look at Doris strolling in here with a two four under his arm like he owns the place. Yeah. No, there is a natural uh, funniness to Canadians. But it's not, I don't know if it's a mean-spiritedness, though, but there is that kind of nickname culture. There's that uh, prank culture. Yeah. Um, at least, I, you know, something I, I feel like, America is much more sensitive to things than Canada is. At least when I tell stories about what we did in high school for fun versus what other people in America did, you know, like you grew up in Ottawa. Yeah, I went to I went to uh, Canada, uh, the Earl of March in Canada. Earl of March. Okay, fair enough. So, in uh, I, I went to Brookfield High School. Okay. And uh, it was just complete madness. But we don't have big you know, sweet 16s in Canada. I mean, I didn't go to my graduation. I mean, there's not a lot of emphasis put on these ceremonial aspects. It's not taken as seriously. And, uh, yeah, I feel like in Canada, there is, like, you're absolutely right. You know, everyone's got a nickname or we make fun of the way our friends talk. And it's all it's, it's all fair game. Well, I, don't, I, th I think we don't do sweet 16 and a lot of that prom stuff because a big part of Canada is I'm not American. It's sort of like Scotland with England. Scotland right. saw that the English love Christmas, so they go, oh, no, 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 we're not Christmas. We're New Year's Eve. We do Hogmanay. And mm. I think uh, a lot of Canadian cultures sort of to, to spite America. No, 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 we're not doing that. But, yeah, you're right about the rough housing. And, I, again, I think that's booze and Scottish culture. But I was watching some documentary on gangland about bloods and crips, and they go, for their initiation, they have to run the gamut where 12 guys will pound the crap out of them to become initiated in the gang and you're like yeah that's someone in my high school who farted and didn't say safety and you we get to beat the crap out of you till you can yeah. name five breakfast cereals that was just yeah, yeah, yeah. everyday life yeah punch buggy no punch backs whatever it was yeah. yeah yeah it was like let's find ways to abuse each other and if you put rules around it it's like we had a geneva convention crab apple fights in canada <laughs> Remember, you just find crab apples, start throwing them at friends until someone would say, 
too close, and then you would respect that rule. So we had <laughs> rules, but we were still abusing each other. It we was, were terrorists. We were hardy. We, we were, were we were good terrorists. The FLQ, they negotiated. Yeah. And they Remember only the killed old? what, like seven guys? And they only exactly. cursed Canada with a bilingual albatross around its neck for decades. Um, we agree. We agree. We agree. We completely agree. You see, that's back when terrorism was fun and people stood a chance of surviving. The FLQ was one of the greatest terrorist organizations ever. I couldn't agree more. And you know, the and beauty the, of the FLQ is the women were hot. They didn't do any of this pouring acid in the face and putting burkas on them. Back then, the t a female terrorist was like uh, Patty Hearst. She looked fun. Yeah. Well, also from French Canada, where every woman is absolutely beautiful. I mean, I think, I mean, stripping is an option, right? I think it was doctor, lawyer, stripper in, in Quebec. Now, I'm, I don't want to stereotype anyone. But um, yeah, absolutely. And I think the joke is, if you want a free flight to Cuba, all you have to do is kidnap a uh, Canadian cabinet minister. Isn't that right? I think that's how we the are not goes. condoning that on this show, but it has been discussed as an option for others. Okay, yes. last thing, John. Last. And this, this goes. Oh yeah, we're done. This John, goes back to my other point about mean. You and I, uh, just to come fully out of the closet, are big fans of the movie Windy City Heat. Yeah, absolutely. Are now, you even allowed to say you're a big fan of it? See, this is how confused I am with the whole thing. I, I sort of feel like it's like being a member of a cult. I sort of, I don't tell yeah. people who don't know, but I'm telling everyone in the world right now. Windy City Heat is a film that isn't just a movie. It is a culmination of a 20-year prank that's still yeah. going now that most people just can't handle. We'll show a clip of it after this. But it really is one of the funniest things ever to happen. And I think one of the reasons that you and I both like it is because it is so darn cruel. Well, yeah, it, it, it's cruel but confusing. It's a, show, it's, it's a movie that people, it's a, it, it draws a line in the sand. Like you either become obsessed or, and want to share it with absolutely everybody, or you want to turn it off after 20 minutes and say, I can't stomach this, this poor man. <laughs> um, but the, I could not help but investigate and go down the, go down the road. And you were on the road at some point, and uh, yeah, Long what a great storyline that was, yeah. Um, but you're right, uh, there is undeniable cruelty um, going on. Um, but the, what, what, what's the argument? Can you argue that there's also some an aspect of loveliness to Windy City Heat and the Big Three. No, you can't. Nope, it's pure evil, and I <laughs> love if, it. Well, then what? If, okay, okay. So you you don't have, but your moral compass is. I mean, is pointing directly north when you're a part of it. You oh, feel that's like a good point, and I think that comes back to what you were saying about victims. The guy is a racist, sexist, homophobic, selfish, fraudulent liar who's ripping right. off the government for a fake accident, is obsessed with himself, and will screw over all his friends at the drop of a hat, and has right. done many times. I mean, yes. Jimmy Kimmel gave him that movie, and he sued Jimmy to the tune of 40 grand. By the way, right. interesting that he was dating Sarah Silverman at the time. She hated the movie. Woman's perspective, man's perspective. Mm -hmm. Um... So he's a great victim. But once you've established that this guy isn't, you know, like a handicapped kid, then all bets are off. We're throwing you right. to the wolves. Okay, yeah, because you see, as an outsider, I don't know, you have more insight than I do because you're part, you're, you're in the cult. I'm you're in the cult. the cult. I'm a member of this prank. You are. You, you, and that's, that's what I find fascinating, too. You live a life, a public life in the media as someone else. Like, and even me saying that, I feel like, oh, no, what if Perry stumbles across this? But then I think, well, I don't know what he knows and what he thinks. So, uh, but it's yeah, one of the most fascinating things. It changed. Uh, we uh, bringing it back quickly. Canadian. So, <laughs> oh jeez, eh? Oh jeez, he's so, really bringing it back, eh? Yeah, bringing it back, eh? Um, you know, Canadian uh, comedy. Growing up in Canada, and some of the shows felt rather soft. I don't know if you had that opinion. Comedy shows like um, you know Royal Canadian Air Force, etc kind of lampooning and satire, but in a very kind of non-offensive way, and everything always felt very safe, safe, safe for a long time. It was shows like Mr. Show in the United States and, you know, uh, Windy City Heat that said allowed me to kind of do the things I really wanted to do. It was well, don't I forget, shows like that. don't sleep on our fellow Ottawan, Tom Green. Absolutely, you're correct. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> a real mean guy. <laughs> who made fun of a lot of innocent people <laughs> and did a great job. I'm for all this, to be clear. 
You're for you're for meanness. I'm general? for mean. You got to choose your victim. Obviously, you don't go up to an old right. lady and slap her in the face. But you know, and well, plus, it's not malicious. I'm not burning you with a coat hanger or throwing butric acid in your face. I'm saying, look at Dor chatting in. He's got the green corduroy hat there, like a little leprechaun hunter. What are you going out back on the fourth to uh, to attack the lucky? Okay, it's not that funny. But take you get it the easy, eh? I got take it easy. <laughs> got too drunk. I was I was okay with it until Gavin started talking about my toque. Eh? We should just yeah. hang up. I blew it. I blew the interview. Let's let him go. Sorry, John. Won't happen nothing again. Got, nothing got blown. Come on. Oh, okay. Sorry. Nothing got blown. We got. It. I wanted to wrap it up in a funny way, but fine. If you want to. Oh, my apologies. Okay. Well, let's go back. We'll cut this part out. We okay. We're stuck. Well, let's leave this in. Okay. And now... Boy, we're really shattering the stereotype of Canadians being funny. <laughs> oh, that's something I disagree with as well, by the way. I grew up... Everyone in America says, why are Canadians so funny? And I would say they're not. I know so many unfunny people. I don't think there's anything in the water. We have a disproportionate all, number of funnies. And you know why? Because it's so cold that we watch TV too much. And then we have a good educational system. So we're watching TV with this analytical mind and you yeah. end up with like a Jim Carrey, who's obviously not a, a comedian's comedian, but he's still very accomplished. And he uh, is just like- One of my favorites. He's a human television. You just turn the mm. channels with him. That's how yeah. we got so funny. Okay, so that's the analysis. Okay, fair enough. Do you know what I like about you? You do the analysis, you evaluate it, and then you come up with your opinion. Uh, you don't just say it because someone else is thinking it. Oh, I thought I, it through. I eh? like you, Gavin. I like you more than a friend, John. Thanks for coming on the show. I love you more than a friend. Whoa. Goodbye. Let's uh, pull up if you can find Windy City Heat. It's one of these movies where um, uh, people regret watching it because it takes over your life because it's not just this movie there's the prank phone calls they did with him there's the the old cable access show that jimmy kimmel used to do with him it goes on and on and on and there's people like if you can get on the facebook fan club page they call themselves um uh jehovah's witnesses what are they called again oh my god i'm spacing uh Boy, they would be mad at me for forgetting that. Sorry, the adrenaline's pumping here. I'm on TV. And uh, uh, they, they are fanatical on a daily basis. They contact him. Anyway, just please check out this movie. John and I endorse it wholly. It has, though it's Chicago-based, it has a lot of Canada on it. Um, can we show the, if you show the beginning of the trailer, it really sums up what this show is about. <laughs> Please, just for a second. Perry, don't, Perry worry, don't, let, don't let this get you upset. 25 years. Unleash the fury. Guys, why don't you do this? Why don't you just take a seat? Just come in here, take a All seat. Right. So you can All right. <laughs> All right? Mo, but be quiet. Don't do anything to disrupt them this time, okay? Do you want oh, Perry to God. get this ball? Yeah. Perry, we're How do you guys deal with these two? This one especially. Perry, I... Breaks in this door, breaks Perry, in this Perry. door. I need you to, to, to get this job. All right. Thank you. So, so, so calm down. How long do we watch this? Again, I mean, right? I could watch it. I'm gonna I've seen this movie 50 version. times. So is John. Perry. It's heaven. Let's do this. Let's continue from where we were at. Let's just take it from the top there, that monologue. All right, let's go. That's Dane Cook, by the way. And Dane Cook and Bobcat Goldthwait. My name is Stone. Stone Fury. Yeah, this is my town, Chicago. City of broken shoulders. <laughs> City of big shoulders. Broken shoulders? <clears throat> and broken dreams. Do you want to start again? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All right, anyway, sorry. I'm not going to bore you with this. It goes on. on The entire movie is on YouTube. It flopped. Kimmel poured a bunch of money into it. It aired on Comedy Central. Everyone hated it because they assume Perry knows what's going on. So no one liked it. I think it sold 12,000 copies. I actually, just to name drop here, I've asked Kimmel to send me a box. And he's like, what do you think? I have a box of these? I'm the one buying them on Amazon. I'm the reason it does well on Amazon because I'm constantly buying boxes. I th there, there, a lot of people who get involved in this movie will buy 50 and just give them out at Christmas. I think uh, the guy who does uh, Drunk History, Derek Waters, just bought a box. Mike Judge is really into it too. It's See, it's a curse. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed.
We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past, but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them. And now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers, Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. Want to have dinner with Faith Goldie? Grab a drink with Brian Lilly. Talk politics with Ezra. You can do it all on the Rebel Cruise. This November, join us for great debates, gourmet meals, and gorgeous scenery as we sail from Fort Lauderdale around beautiful Caribbean islands. It's an intimate week where you can really get to know your favorite Rebel personalities and meet other Rebel lovers too. Space is limited, so visit therebelcruise.ca to sign up now. Hello folks, um, you might be wondering what I'm drinking here. Can we zoom in on this? This is from Talib Starks, who just finished the book Black Lives Matter, and he has created his own delicious homebrew called Talib's uh, Premium Beer, and it's made from pure white gilt extract. I guess you can't see that very well because it's green, but it is absolutely delicious. I guess uh, one of the reasons white gilt is so popular is because it tastes so damn good. Um, yeah, I was, when we were talking about doing this show, I was thinking of Bob and Doug McKenzie, and I looked them up and watched some of the old eps. I remember them being way funnier. I don't want to disparage SCTV, and obviously John Candy, Martin Short are gods. Even, especially, their work after SCTV. Catherine O'Hara, uh, she's, she's not even human, she's so good. She did the sketch Half Wits, which I think was the, the peak of SCTV. Maybe we should pull that up. See if you can pull up the SCTV sketch half wits. Um, but I was going through some of the old box sets of SCTV and I sort of realized I had a selective memory and I was remembering it being way funnier than it was and I was just sort of picking, I think we do this with a Saturday Night Live also. We just pick the amazing ones. However, when I go back through Trailer Park Boys, I uh, don't feel that. In fact, I go, yep, holds up. And when I watch the movie FUBAR, I go, been years and years, watching it now, still love it. And maybe it's because I'm patriotic and I grew up with, those, with Terry and Dean, those exact guys. But when I see them, it's just music to my ears. I don't know, I'm just zapped back to high school. Can you th show some of FUBAR? I just have so much affection for Terry and Dean. Plan B is, is just to keep on giving her. What exactly is that? Mean? Give her. You just you go out and you give her. Like you you work hard. That's what's that. Is that a plan? Yeah, that's a plan right there. We used to party a lot, but not so much anymore. So whenever whenever we do get together, it's awesome. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. You know when uh, Hernstein and Murray wrote the bell curve, they weren't trying to say that there's smart people that rule and then they're stupid people they were trying to say that intelligence is innate and who cares who's smart or not you can't not everyone has to go take stem at mit let's hang around with some hosers like my dad did that's what at least murray was going for and i couldn't agree more i don't like smart people some of my best friends are geniuses and we don't get along i like dummies anyway dave lawrence terry and paul spence dean have another movie out uh, Legend of Whitey, I believe. I hadn't heard about this, but let's pull that up, shall we? The budget for this movie looks insane. And I know those guys, they're not rich. Mr. Giddings, you have been relieved of your scalp duties with more or less mounted police due to gross misconduct. Here's Paul Spence. <laughs> How you doing? Is that you, Luther? Long time no see. <laughs> I guess he plays an Indian. I think he is an Indian. Yeah. Oh, now, enough of that. That's the smell of a perfect summer night. Modification <laughs> of the mouth. Oh, jeez. Okay. We're gonna find the pretty boys that done this to you. 
What is this, The Revenant? You seen this half-breed? His brother lover? Oh, a buffalo, is that all? All right, that's enough of that. Paul, are you there? Uh, yeah. How's it going, eh? Hey, I wanted to talk to you about uh, about John Candy and, and uh, that like I I can't uh, I can't remember a bad John Candy episode, but I can remember pretty much everybody else being uh, you know they had you know they were they were doing so much with so little and so little time. Like you know yeah you have a sketch comedy team they get together and they have like six months to do their sketch show. And these guys had like a day to put on an entire... But wait a minute. Didn't they go out to Winnipeg and they had an entire TV studio, like a Fox News building with yeah. all the equipment and all the fancy cameras to go and record their sketches? Didn't they have way more resources than most people starting out? Uh, oh, they had tons of resources, but they didn't have a lot of time. I mean, I think that's just like... that's. The, I think that's what is impressive to me. I mean, when, you know... You're doing the same thing. You're trying to create content, trying to be funny, trying to make funny things that are sort of relevant to today. And yet, you know, try and come up with like five super funny ideas in one week. I think that's what like, you know, you're saying you, you go back and look at it and you say, oh, yeah, it's, I, I love this sketch. And then you go back. It's like, that's eh, all right. If you put them all together, the best, best ones, they're, they're like insanely good. But, you know. It's like Saturday Night Live too. I mean, I think that's the challenge that, that and I, that's why I love it. I love it. I look at SCT of I'm like, they have the same challenges that I do that we do, where you're really doing your best to come up with like really funny ideas, but they, you know, they don't just happen, right? It's just like you come up with five really funny ideas. Only one of them is super funny, right? I agree with you. And the other thing people say often is uh, it's about the the context of the time. And sometimes I I don't agree with that because I think. Like, I listen to Lenny Bruce, and he's still amazing. It all stands up. Sometimes I think humor is humor, and if it was funny, it's always going to be funny. Like FUBAR, for example. Uh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I do want you to check out, or I, I got it here, uh, Gil Fisher, uh, Wendy O. Williams. Do you know, you remember Wendy Williams, right? The, the, the singer of the Plasmatics, yeah. Yeah, she was on, uh, on, one, on Jan, John Candy had that character, Gil Fisher. Oh, yeah. It's... The I mean, I, it's the penultimate thing for me because I'm, you know, like a rock and roll guy. And uh, just like she comes out with these like leathery wings and then she starts <laughs> the sort of the whole idea of the sketch is just her like <laughs> destroying the studio. And it was all set up, right? Like SCTV style. So she hits a TV and then like the cheesy sort of explosions come out. Yeah, and it was pretty great when they did punk. Remember the queen haters? No. I hate the bloody queen. Yeah, yeah, I remember the queen haters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, you got to dig up all of that. Plasmatics on SCTV, Halfwits on SCTV, and the Queen haters. Wendy, Wendy Williams. That's that'll come up on YouTube. Yeah. Hey, Paul. Yeah. This movie. Yeah. The last Whitey's Last Stand. What's it called? Legend of Whitey. The Legend of Whitey. Now I'm looking at this. I haven't seen it yet, so I'm not doing a very good job of interviewing you. But uh, w what's going on with that budget? You had a buffalo. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, I mean, look, Dave's not here, is he? That I just, that I'm not familiar, aware of, like he's not just watching. No, somehow. he's staying at his container right now, but we will definitely have him on next week. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, hats off to him. He put this crazy budget together. It was a shoestring kind of thing where there was a, there's a, there's a ranch out to, in Alberta that they've done, you know, name a Western and it's probably, they probably at least checked out the location if not shot there. Um, like it's just, you know, they've got like hundreds of acres of land and there's a village and all this stuff. And yeah. Um, Dave called them with the producer and they're like, Oh, what are you guys doing this summer? They're like, Oh, we're actually, it's pretty slow this summer. We could give you a deal. So, uh, so yeah, we basically was kind of had to be done in this very specific time frame. So that was our, okay, we've got the location, which is, you know, the most beautiful badlands kind of scene in the world. And uh, we were able to use um, the costume chest that was at this, that, that was also sort of like not being used at the time. Um, so everything you see was was cut rate, you know. And then the, I think the buffalo was one of the most expensive things. I, I, again, you, I don't remember myself, but, um, you know, the, it's, uh, the, the, this guy has a bunch of animals, but the, bu <laughs> the buffalo being like the most dangerous and hardest to kind of <laughs> deal with. Like there, there's some scenes where, 
Um, I was about, uh, I don't know if you can see my hands here. I was about this close to it. Uh-huh. Uh, and then the next day, he gored the trainer. Like, he no. He, he flipped him 20 feet in the air. Like no. This thing, yeah. And the guy landed on his back. And then the buffalo flipped him again. Like, the guy landed on the ground, and the buffalo flipped him again. And it, after that, I was, you know, I was a little bit uh, more hesitant. Yeah. Uh, I was like, I'll stay 20 feet away uh, from this crazy wild animal. <laughs> well, you know, we get a lot of flack as white colonists for killing all the buffalo. But what a lot of people don't talk about is a lot of those buffaloes were jerks. I say all of them. Yeah. A hundred percent of buffaloes are jerks, ladies. So before man. you get your panties in a bunch about the, the, the extinction of them, go meet one. <laughs> uh, but again, buffalo meat, delicious. Delicious. That's another good reason to kill them. Okay, last question, Paul. Do you get people who want you to be the deaner, and when you're just Paul, they go, oh, can't you just permanently be a hoser for me? Um, all the time. Yeah. Um, that must be exhausting. Well, I mean, I am the deaner uh, <laughs> after, after six years. So, you know, when people are like, why aren't you the deaner? I'm just like, wait till I finish the six pack and the deaner will show up. <laughs> you know, don't you worry. You're going to have more deaner than you can handle. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And we like you more than a friend. Uh, sweet, man. Enjoy that white beer. I will. It's pee. Um. Sorry, but when we talk about all these videos, I feel like they sort of accrue. Do you got any? We won't watch them all. Catherine, SNL stole Half Wits, by the way. They had another, they had a game show. It's a game show for idiots. And uh, <laughs> it, show, it shows how incredibly talented she is. I didn't realize this recently, but Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy are married. They must have some funny kids. Okay, go see if you can scroll forward to Martin Short. Thank you Johnny. Hello. You got to read his book, I must say. There it is. Wait. Stop. Uh no, keep playing, sorry. Now Arthur, you were telling us that you are in medical research. Would you care to tell us a little about that? I lied. I'm sorry? I lied. I thought it would sound good on TV. <laughs> okay, now well, go to the next guy. What? Martin Short. Now, if you read his book, uh I must say, he talks about this brilliant idea he had where he said, I'm going to put black along the bottom half of my teeth to make them look stumpier. And it probably looks really weird close up, but through the filters of television, it works. And it makes for one of the most disturbing looking people <laughs> ever to appear on television. Look at his face. He, re he brought this back too with that ma male synchronized swimming thing on SNL. But this was the original Lawrence. Look at his face. <laughs> You're still in school. Righto, Alex. Postgraduate work? No, high school. I'm having some degree of difficulty getting through high school. I see. Well, good but to have I'll you here. I'll do it. I'm sure you will, we'll Lawrence. Do it. And, uh, because I have certain goals in life I feel compelled to complete. Very, very good. One of oh. which is becoming a circuit court judge. Good. Good to have ambitions. And the second is perhaps playing professional hockey. Good to have you here, Lawrence, and uh, good luck to you tonight. All right, that's Hello, enough. That's enough. We can't sit here going through uh, SCTV sketches all day, although I highly recommend, on your own accord, you check out The Plasmatics, Wendy O. Williams, and The Queen Haters, a punk band where John Candy was the drummer and Martin Short was the singer. It was sort of like Dead Boys meets Sex Pistols. Really high quality. But again, I'm sorry. I go back over it, and when I put in the box set, a lot of time to kill. So that is the million-dollar question here, folks. Is what's funny funny and it's perpetual, or is it about the context of the time? I don't know. But I have a feeling funny is funny, and funny is mean. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the Rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a fearless travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra LeVant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to therebel.media slash store to find out more. If I 
Heave, hi, ho. Let's, um, let's move on to another guest. Have we got Janet Bloomfield on the line? Janet Bloomfield. I believe she lives up in Sudbury Way, eh? Now, here's my thing. Housewives are a formidable political force. They elected Barack Obama. Take away the housewives, you take away his presidency. He wouldn't have won without the woman vote. Justin Trudeau. Do you really think men voted for Justin Trudeau? Do you really think dads are responsible for that prime minister? He's a hunk with nothing to say. Women elected Justin Trudeau. So they are a very important and influential part of our culture, yet we never see them on the news. They're never on CNN. We're never on Fox News. Why not? That doesn't make any sense. We've got Black Lives Matter is on every second show. They represent what? If they're talking about black thugs, they represent maybe 3% of the population. Where's this 45%, these housewives? Well, we've got one for you here. Janet, are you there? I am here. Nice to see you again. How are you doing? Great. I am fantastic. Since the last time we spoke, um, I managed to get some cookies knocked off, got the laundry done, and uh, pissed off some people on the internet. Now, I want you to know, as a woman, the fact that you breed and you're a housewife and you don't have an exciting career in fashion PR means that you are uh, wasting your time. You're a sexist, I guess. I guess, yeah. I'm, I'm either a traitor or I'm a parasite. I contribute <laughs> nothing, nothing to society at all. Isn't it amazing if the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was that you can make a human come out of you and then with a top hat go, top of the morning to you, and feminists go, that's lame. That's lame, yes. See, if I went and worked for some corporate boss, some corporate master, that would be freedom. But working for the men and the children that I love, that's slavery. It does really seem like feminism is sexist because they've taken the special things about a woman. And by the way, it's not just breeding. Like those making cookies and that stuff, it's different than when a stay-at-home dad does it. There is an innate nurturing. And we talked about this before once where you said women have this genetic trait where they can see the glass is half full in every situation. And it might come from looking at terrible drawings and saying, yeah, that really does look like a dog, even though it's just a potato with four lines. That makes women happier because the grass is always, no, not the grass is always greener, but things are always going well. They're, they're perpetual optimists, and that's a survival instinct. To take that away is to literally make them less happy. It's making women absolutely miserable. And, and what you just talked about comes from feminist theory. The very first women's studies professor at Harvard, maybe Yale, one of those two schools, Carol Gilligan, she wrote a book called In a Different Voice, where she looked at how women and men make different moral decisions. They use different frameworks. And women's moral framework, our entire way of being, everything that makes us happy, is suited towards a small domestic sphere filled with children, older people. It's about caregiving. And men are happier in a broader, more open, universal, formal um, society and structure. And if you try and flip those around, you try and jam men into that little small domestic space, Fear, the vast majority of them are incredibly unhappy. You throw women out into this wide formal structure of society and ask them to make moral decisions when they're equipped to look at potatoes with sticks and call them dogs and everybody's <laughs> just miserable. And more importantly, women voters just up every civilized nation. They have absolutely no idea how to vote. They're completely irrational. They bring the barbarians in because that's what we do. That's what we do as mothers. That's what we do as caregivers. Oh, everybody should come in and be happy, and we're going to take care of everyone. Well, that works great in neighborhoods. That doesn't work so great up against ISIS. Couldn't be truer. Can we see your shirt there? I'm not trying to look at your breasts. Well, I mean, that's sort of meant for that, but yeah. This is, <laughs> this is Milo Yiannopoulos, Milo Swag. This is Feminism is Cancer. Uh, I couldn't agree more that it is a malignant growth that spreads and spreads and you don't realize how serious and how deadly it is until it has just metastasized into this huge tumor. And that's what we're dealing with right now. We have feminism as a tumor in society. Everybody hates it. There's only a small minority of people who actually support it, and yet they have somehow gotten this extraordinary power to govern the lives of the rest of us. And you mentioned Justin Trudeau. That guy is such a and he is just one of the worst examples 
of feminism as cancer. He I really is. He's the metastasization of the cancer. And I, I got to ask, though, you're up in you're up in Sudbury there in northern Ontario or whatever we call it, western Ontario. Uh, Thunder Bay. I'm even further north than that. I'm Thunder Bay. What, yes. what are you a pariah around the other housewives or do they agree with you? What's your status? Absolutely not. Harsh climates tend to kill feminism really quickly. It's hard to buy the story that I'm oppressed when it's 40 degrees out, someone's got to shovel the driveway, and I'm in here making coffee and frying some bacon. Really <laughs> hard to sell me on the idea that I'm the one who's oppressed. And you know, Thunder Bay, this town has taken some real hits under NAFTA. We've, we've lost a lot of our industry. There are a lot of families around here who survive on wild protein. That means a hunter that they need someone to go out and get ducks and get fish, go fishing, go get the deer. Women can do that, but we prefer not to. I can go out and field dress a deer if I have to, but you know what? Ew. Like, if I have a guy to do that, I am totally, I'll, I'll take the cooking part. You do all the icky butchering stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's worked that way for thousands of years, but for some reason we got to reboot it just this past five years. Everything has to change. Genders don't exist. These are fat, unmarried, unhappy women living in urban centers, and they flip the light switch, and the lights come on like magic. Yeah. They, the work that men do is invisible in urban centers, which is what makes these women think that they could live without men. You'd be living in, in, in a mud hut. It would take society 24 hours to utterly collapse if men took one day off work. If women took a day off, you'd have to fetch your own coffee and, you know, maybe make your own sandwich. And we'd be less happy. You know, it would be disappointing because she wouldn't be around. Well, Janet, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. And by the way, God forbid this should ever happen. But say hypothetically, your husband and my wife were to die in a plane crash. Who knows what we could be commiserating with each other? Who knows what the future could hold? I wouldn't want that to happen. But if it did. That would be terrible. And, and yes, I accept your proposal. Oh. If, I, if our spouses both die, we can get married. Wow. That beard. was easy. That, that's the beard. I'm sold. I'm sold. <laughs> Okay, I like you more than a friend. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to therebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on The Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Um, let's talk to, uh, Chris over in Ontario. Chris, are you there? Ah, oh, what are you here there? You say, how you doing? Now, judging by that accent, we're going down into the Ottawa Valley, are we? No, I'm not even close. I'm actually from Richmond Hill, but I went to school, uh, out east in Halifax there, so. Oh, okay. Eastern Halifax. That's got quite a rich accent. That's got to be linked to Scotland. I, I keep linking everything back to Scotland, but, uh, what can I do you for? Well, what do you think about pretty much all this political correctness that, uh, you know, pretty much Canada is dealing with right now? Uh, uh, Trudeau is saying he's a feminist. And you know, where, where do you see our country, uh, you know, going in the next five years in terms of, uh, you know, not trying to step on toes and allowing immigrants, in essence, to um, almost uh, infuse their, their culture and, and make it uh, even more politically correct where you can't even, you know, have your opinion without being called a racist or anything like that. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about this capitulation that Canada's doing. There is no end to it. Now, I remember Justin Trudeau said something like, the biggest challenge of our time is labeling things that don't have a label. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. He, I think he smoked a joint, went snowboarding, and said, you know, all the different genders now have to be identified, all the different variations of race, blah, 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 like we have to waste our time with something we've never done before. We seem to survive all these years not caring about what a gender and a race was, but now all of a sudden everything has to be classified. And the thing you'll notice, by the way, with genders, this is a great example, is it was male, female, and then trans. And you went, you know what? This isn't really putting me out. Ah, fine. There's three. And then they go, no, it's four. And then they go, and now Facebook has about 15 options. The real moral here is it's like a spoiled child. And when you let them have chocolate bars for dinner and watch TV all day, then they want more chocolate bars and more TV. Then they're mad at you for letting them watch too much TV. It's a lot like Islam. Politically correct Canada is a tiny, much more docile and safe version of ISIS. 
in that you can't satisfy them. Look at Saudi Arabia now. You have a woman with a burqa. You can see some of her purple socks. Oh, that's the end of the world. She's got to get 40 lashes. So the moral of the story here, and thanks for calling, caller, is you can't satisfy these people. Political correctness has no end. It just means I want more apologies because it gives me more power. Uh, let's talk to Kyle up there in uh, Saskatoon. Kyle, are you there? I am here, yeah. Thanks for taking my call. Hey, how's it going, eh? It's going very well. I, uh, I'm actually uh, from Saskatchewan, but uh, working in North Dakota right now, and I just had a couple thoughts um, on the Trudeau thing. I thought it would be pretty interesting. I've been thinking this for a while. If you could do, you know, once a week, maybe a five-minute segment on done things Trudeau has done this week, I think that would be pretty entertaining for your Canadian fans. That's going to be a busy show. And, you know, people say, they used to say to George W. Bush, how can you be so stupid and be president? And you, he, you know, he went to Yale or wherever he went. But I, and I have sort of poo-pooed the, that's stupid, you're stupid thing. I think Trudeau is unique in that he really is as vapid as anyone, as everyone says. I bet if you introduce him to a new game, board game, it would take him three times as long to figure out the rules that it would take everyone else. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And I think uh, just when you think he's kind of reached a new low, he comes up with something new. And I don't think he's malicious or anything. I just think it's just, uh, um, I don't want to say mental deficiency either, but just, just lacking a little something upstairs maybe. Well, I'm at the point now where I'm starting to like it. I think it's endearing. You know when you hang out with a little kid and he says things that remind you of when you were a little kid? I'm getting that from him. Like back when he said, uh, we have to th reevaluate. We have to rethink things as fundamental as time and space, not to get all science fictiony on you. And I thought that's almost cute because I remember being 15 and saying stuff like that and hoping no one would know that I was full of crap. Right. I think you would have been a fun guy to go to a bush party with, but again, just I think it's uh, not appropriate for the leader of a country. Just, just my uh, sense. You know what? I don't want to stab my brother in the back because he doesn't like me talking about this. But my brother did go to a bush party with him. My yeah. brother went camping with him, and he was worried about the campfire leaving a carbon footprint. I so remember the story. The myths are true. Thanks for calling. Um, let's uh, talk to Stephen over in T.O. Steve, are you there? I am here, Gavin. Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. How's it going, eh? I'm doing pretty actually from Montreal. Oh, yeah. I'm it's probably the only Trump supporter from Montreal, actually. Yeah, that town has, you know, Quebec has the same curse Scotland has, and in a way the same curse Canada has with America. They are so dead set on the underdog that the underdog could be, well, in the case of ISIS and the Islam, a murderer, and you go, I'm rooting for those guys. So Montreal, they're always going to go for whoever is not the Trump guy, and you go, eh, Trump would be better for you, Montreal. They're all Bernie supporters up there. Yeah, well, we have Jean-Guy Tremblay on the show, and uh, he's moved to America to be closer to Bernie. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's his destiny, my friend. Uh, but yeah, they're all... Uh, uh, isn't Trump just the American version of René Lévesque anyways? René Lévesque? That man, man, that takes me back. Yeah, he is in a way, and that's the irony. Like Jean-Guy Tremblay are, uh, is a regular on the show, and he talks about how we need open borders for everyone except Quebec. They need to be pure laine, and they can't even have Haitians, even though those are French, because they're not pure laine, they're not pure wool. And Quebec is so hypocritical about this, where, and Israel is the same way in many ways, where they're all for a wall around Israel, but they're not for a wall that Trump builds. And it becomes isolationist if we say it, but it's about preservation if another group says it. Look, Tibet is anti-immigration. They don't want Chinese coming over. There's nothing wrong with being anti-immigration. It should work for Tibet, it's worked for Israel, and it's ostensibly worked for Quebec. Thanks for calling, buddy. Thanks.